Thank you, Andrew. So I tr I'm trying to, to beat my predecessor by showing more slides, if possible. Um, actually, being in this room is great because it reminds me 20 years ago when I was leading a team where we are trying to understand how room acoustic works, applying quantum chaos, you know, this very fancy, weird, uh, wacko uh, mathematics. And this, actually, you can understand, I was analyzing this, all this uh, structure may not only be, you know, creative, artistic things, but actually they serve optimization methods to actually diffuse and optimize acoustic impression. So I could explain to you later on, but that's another talk, how it works. And it is linked actually to deep insight of chaos and quantum, quantum mechanics. But that's another talk. Uh, today, um, I would like to share with you a little bit about how as scientists who are coming from physics, com complex systems, from mathematics, try to understand this problem of resilience and the problems that we have been discussing until, until now. And I'm going to speak about Dragon Kings. But first, I would like very fast, very, very fast, to review with you some of the problems that we are facing. We are facing many, many problems. They are, they are piling up from you know, the crisis. This is the shrinking of the market capitalization of the banks in billions. You see a major impact of the major banks in the world. Um, continuing in the extraordinary new experiment, never it has been done in the world until now, where you see the balance sheets of China central bank, the ECB central bank, the Federal Reserve, and Japan in trillions of dollars. This is an experiment, a real life experiment that has never been done, and the consequences are still to be seen. Um, continuing the diagnostic of problems, nothing has really changed in the crisis. When you look, for example, at the 800 trillion dollars of notional value of these uh, weapons of mass destruction, according to Warren Buffett, <coughs> which are the derivatives. So we are still doing this at an extraordinary level with consequences that are still not understood. If we look at the problem of sovereign debts, we are, and actually, for example, if you take the US, uh, racing together with Ireland, with Italy, and so on. Of course, uh, Japan is the great winner in terms of the amount of debts of the government, which, are, have been, which have been doubling since the crisis and still a massive problem. Coming to another dimension, malnutrition, and actually this so-called problem of epidemics, of obesity and chronic disease has blossomed and skyrocketed. Now, one third of American and close to that in Europe, growing in China, in Indonesia, and so on, are obese, not just overweight, obese. And associated with this, there are extraordinary problems of chronic disease which are skyrocketing. Problem of aging. It used to be, until recently, that four in Europe, four, five people were working for each retiree. In 10, 20 years, there will be 1.5 people working for each retiree with endowment and uh, liabilities which are absolutely impossible to sustain. The price for the US is estimated at 1,100% 1, of GDP. Absolutely impossible. So huge problems. Energy problem. We have been undergoing a massive change of regime around the 1950s after the Second World War where the rate of consumption of various resources, in particular oil and gas, has skyrocketed with actually a diminishing return in terms of the annual, annual growth extracted from this. And there are many issues with the importance of this energy problem. The water problem has been alluded before. This is, uh, if you look at the dark blue here and the open part, are the parts which are absolutely not sustainable in the different parts of the world. We are developing like mad on this planet. We are depleting water resources which take thousands of years or hundreds of years at the rate of time scales of uh, years or decades. Another problem, soil erosion, which is very little discussed. It takes thousands of years to transform, and I was inspired actually yesterday when I arrived at the airport to look at this landscape from the airport to Reykjavik, where you see this uh, uncultivated or undeveloped vegetation, because it takes a lot of time, hundreds of years to thousands of years, by weathering to actually crush this rock, this magma, and transform it into a soil that can grow vegetation. We are actually, by our human action, depleting at a rate which is 10 to thousands of times faster 
than the recuperation of the planet in order to make soil. So the soil, top soil is called, that have disappeared at a rate which is fantastic, like five to cent, 10 centimeters, with the, the, the danger that we have no soil anymore to grow any vegetation or any food. We are now no more in the Holocene, we are in the, what is called the Anthropocene, where actually the human has such an impact that they are changing climate, global warming. They are, and this is a self graph I'm not going to uh, comment in detail, in any way you look at in terms of ecological impact and so on, gas emission and so forth, we are just in the last few decades or half a century completely entering new regimes, which are, I mean, great question mark, sustainable, that's a big question mark, with the possibility of global um, shift. Another problem, six global biological extinctions. You may know that uh, over the history of biology on the Earth, over a time scale of one billion years, there has been five major uh, species extinction, genera extinctions, where something like between 50 and 90% of all genera were wiped out on the planet. We think, biologists think now, they are very famous ones are documented that we are probably entering the sixth greatest extinction whose magnitude is still to be determined with enormous rate of disappearance with consequences we are trying to understand in terms of all the resources and the um, job that this ecology is doing for us. This is very well summarized by this work showing the boundary of the planet according to different dimensions from the, uh, basically summarizing the ability for the planet to take care and to depollute, to somehow filter our activity from ocean acidity to aerosol to the ozone depletion, climate change, phosphorus flow, nitrogen flow, and so on, all our activities. And the evolution of this as a function of time, this is the pre-industrial time where we had very little impact and we were well within the boundary of the recycling by, the, the, by mother planet. And then in the 1950s, 60s, we started to have an impact still within the binary. Jump to 70s, 1970s, 80s, already the nitrogen flow has exceeded the capacity of the planet to uh, cope with this, and we see approaching binaries in other dimensions. And then the latest data shows enormous impact in many dimensions and danger approaching in others. We are consuming 1.5 planet, according to a global measure of impact. By consumption of 1.5 Earth, I mean non-renewable uh, resources. Not, I'm not speaking of oil, of coal, or anything like that, but typically the ability of the planet to recycle or to provide the resources on the time scale of 10 to 100 years we are now actually borrowing for the future. It is reminding us of the fact that actually most of the economics and the way government is done at the level of economics is fight by borrowing. This seems to be also enormous impact in borrowing for the capacity of the planet. We have also problem of extreme industrial disasters. And the big problem is, of course, this is linked with political risk. Political risk, as previous speakers have alluded to, are not going down by many measures. They may be actually plateauing or even increasing, which pose many problems with the uh, steering that we need to do on this planet. And in particular, I want to um, draw attention to the fact, if we look, for example, at the nuclear industry and the nuclear waste, waste which are piling up in million tons, and how it is linked with the stability of society. And the red here shows the ethnic conflicts that have been occurring that may be the source of new problems in steering the good technology. So it's not a problem of technology, it's a problem of stability of society. So where are we going and what can we do? So this is actually a work that we were doing about 10, 15 years ago, suggesting that we are going through a major tipping point, approaching the years 2020 to 2050, through the observation of the trajectory, the global human population, the footprint, as well global financial market, which are kind of proxy of um, our development. Just a month ago, there was a remarkable nature, a, a, a collaborative work by many scientists suggesting that we are approaching within two decades, no more, a major tipping point in the ability for the global planet to cope with our impact. So many, many uh, evidence show this kind of problems. So the problems are piling up, very clear. Should we go sleeping or hiding or on Jupiter? Well, the first attempt as a scientist is to try to understand where it comes from. 
So that's the rest of the talk it is about, is to try to understand, not maybe proposed solution or some illusion of solution, but try to understand, to, in order to devise robust strategies and solutions. And this is the key message of the talk, basically summarized in one slide. Crisis, we propose, this turning point, this tipping point, come from a slow, progressive maturation towards a critical instability in a very precise sense, in the sense of a mathematical language of what people call bifurcations, or, and I will show some example, or phase transitions. And here you see basically the phase transition idea. You take water in a test tube, this water is probably heated 95 Celsius, 99 Celsius. There is a dilation which is progressive. You can measure it with good apparatus. And then you continue to hit and the extrapolation, the linear extrapolation breaks down. You, and this is the problem. Everywhere, when I look at governance of discussions so on people or economic pro projections, they are extrapolating linearly. And what they forget is that very slow minor change of some control parameters may give rise to a microscopic change of regime of enormous proportion, which is give rise to qualitatively new behavior. This is, uh, in my team at ETH Zurich, how we think of crisis in finance, in global markets, how we think of the progressive development of financial bubbles and then sudden crash and crashes. And the way to think about it is to think in terms of critical transitions where depending, for example, on different, let's say, like severity of the problem, the complexity of the problem, you can have either a smooth response to the system, as measured here, for example, by the public attitude, or an abrupt shift to a new regime. So what are the good news? Or, until now, I've stressed a very pessimistic view. Huh? <coughs> there are good news I would like to uh, leave you with. One good news is that there is a fundamental theorem in mathematics, it's called this uh, fundamental reduction theorems, that tells us that actually, close to a transition, it is possible to know the system, to understand how it works, and there is only a few control parameters, they are called, that actually control the transition to the regime. And so the strategy is to actually measure tell signs of the approach to this transition and then try to understand and map the different transition. And the good news is that if you look at transition that occur only through one control parameter, that the big difficulty is to find what it is, there are only 18 modes, only 18 modes to capture all the complexity that I alluded to before all the transition of the complexity, whatever the complexity, only 18 types of transitions. What are the consequences? Well, you can map out, and this is my kind of summary, uh, which um, integrates so many research. Basically, you can map the problem into the level of coupling between different systems and the level of hetero heterogeneity or diversity. And when you go along one direction or, or the other direction, you see different regimes. The, the regime where catastrophic events occur are uh, when there is a lot of coupling, a lot of, a lot of interdependencies, and less heterogeneity. Example, with the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act since 1933, you had integration of banking into insurance, insurance, retail banking, commercial banking, and investment banking into the same institution. So it means that we had certainly much less heterogeneity and much more coupling. We enter this regime where the system can synchronize and give rise to runaway events, global systemic catastrophic events. Now, the second message is this type of transition, they are associated with what I call Dragon Kings. Dragon Kings here is a picture eating the black swan, for those of you who have heard about this concept, <laughs> black swan of my friend Nassim Taleb. And I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about this. And I actually have a, a book. Actually, I have not, uh, it's a proceeding, so I have no any money involved in it. And I brought some copies with me. I would be able to share it with you. This book is about a description and integration of uh, 20 different teams in the world about how the transition go on and what are the type of events that occur. The claims are the following. Most crises are endogenous. They are not coming out of the blue, like the black swans tells us. It, that they are unknowable. No, they are knowable. They can be diagnosed in advance. They can be quantified. There is a degree of probabilistic predictability. As a consequence, you have to take into account the human aspect, the conflict of interest, the role of regulations, the role of incentives. 
And there is responsibility, of course. There is accountability, as opposed to the black swan, which is for me the most dangerous concept because it removes responsibility and accountability. There are consequences for strategic and tactical um, implementations of this. And the idea is to also look at the tail signs, as I said. The key idea by which these crises occur is positive feedback. If you have taken some courses in economics, for example, you have been uh, uh, overwhelmed with teaching on negative feedback, on equilibrium, on the fact that systems are mean reversal, they tend to come back to equilibrium. This is wrong. Yes, many systems have homeostasis, but many things in the social world are working through positive feedback. So let me explain to you what is positive feedback. So this is the standard Econ 101, where you have price and quantity. When uh, price increase, the consumer demand, you buy less, uh, decrease. And the quantity, when price increase, the quantity is increased, so that you come to an equilibrium where price and quantities adjust themselves and converge to stability. Positive feedback is, the larger the price, the larger the consumer demand. It looks like madness, word. Does it occur? Yes, of course, it occurs all the time. During a financial bubble, during a real estate bubble, the higher the real estate price, the higher is the number of people who are actually buying. And this is again and again the same. To show you that we are doing something quantitative, I show you one equation, which is the core of all my research. And we have expanded it so much in many dimensions with much more mathematics in order to try to predict and to forecast this change of crisis that I cannot escape showing it to you. So when you take this exponent equal to one, you have just the exponential growth. As soon as you have positive feedback, this exponent becomes larger than one, and you have a monster, a finite time singularity, this type of hyperbolic growth that, for example, corresponds to the population of humans on this planet. This is the log scale, logarithmic scale, so an equal multiplication by a constant factor corresponds to the same division. So you have factor of tens corresponding to each decade. So in this log scale, logarithmic scale and linear scale over one, 2,000 years, a linear slope corresponds to the Malthusian exponential growth. You have heard of Malthus. Malthus said that the problem of mankind was that we are growing uh, exponentially. Actually, no, he was an optimist. The population has grown super exponentially, with this exponent d larger than one. The more people there are on Earth, the more we are creative, the more we invade new niches, the more we uh, improve, uh, let's say, uh, agriculture and health. So this is reflected in this fantastic super exponential um, data showing positive feedback in action at the scale of the world. So the idea is we can look at the tail sign of incoming crisis by addressing the sign of positive feedback. So the idea is that by this positive feedback, they are Dragon King, these extreme events that occur. And Dragon Kings is a term that I borrowed from, of course, the Chinese tradition. So those of you who can read this, it's a Chinese uh, word for Dragon King in traditional Chinese. By the idea that actually the king in a country or dragon among an ecology of animals are special guys. They result from specifying amplifying mechanism, specific amplifying mecha mechanism that make them knowable. And what are the signs of upcoming transition? This is the most exhaustive list I know that I will not have time, of course, to describe them in detail, that actually scientists are studying now very intensively, very rig vigorously, to actually be able to pinpoint when the system is close to a, pin a tipping point. And we have implemented in our Financial Crisis Observatory at ETH Zurich this methodology to actually put in practice, and I would say it's a quite I would say, immodestly a courageous act on our part because we are really sticking our neck out for the last four years. We have been actually developing advanced ex ante predictions through a, a series of methodology, and we are even put the money of my postdoc, my senior researchers, and mine at stake to actually carry out a real experiment to show that it is feasible. And we are running this financial bubble experiment with two ideas. We can diagnose in real time the crisis, with application to finance. And we can actually also, once the diagnosis is working, we can um, probably tell what is the tipping point. There's a series of methods that you are using, positive feedback, as well as negative feedback and their interplay. And this leads to a remarkable um, understanding of what we are into in this financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis and so on, as a culmination of six major leverage bubbles 
starting with the ITC, <laughs> the monetary policy of the Fed, the reset bubbles, the market bank security bubbles, the CDOs bubbles, the stock market bubbles, the commodity oil bubbles, and so on. And these are examples of the type of prediction that we have been doing. Ex ante, all these cases have been done uh, in advance, have been published about a year before the advent of the turning point with application for various markets, commodities, and even the global bubble made of a series of um, indices. And we are running this through through even algorithm spreading, and this is where I want to stop with, is that we are actually applying this for the tail sign of signature of instabilities as occurred, for example, in 2007, 2008, which is still continuing as we speak in the US, for example, while we have very clear signature of bubble developing in other parts of the world. So, because my time is short, I need to jump up before Andrew jumps on me. And if I can get my last slide, please. Not working. Can you get me? Thank you. So, if I can jump to the last slide, I would say the thing that we have learned is... No? No? no. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, can I have control, please? Can I have control? My last slide, please. Not... Okay. Can I, can I, can I have control, please? Control? Okay. Please? Go up. Two. Yes, thank you. So, um, I wanted to tell you about the fact that resilience involves also individual approach. The lesson I've tried to tell you about is we can diagnose and we should diagnose much more by measuring everything, as the president said. I was very admiring his point of making sensors everywhere on every boat. Diversification is essential, as I alluded to for the banking system. The decoupling of different systems in order to make res resilience is essential. At the individual level, the incentives and motivation is extremely important. And in the end, we have to go back to actually simple solution at the level of individuals. I will stop here and uh, we'll enjoy more discussion later on with each of you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.